I will follow him too. Amen. Amen. Happy New Year. Prosperos años y felicidad. Hallelujah. <laughs> Good to see you this morning. Hello. Is somebody here? <laughs> I got some glasses somewhere. I'll find them sooner or later. One, two, three, four, five. Well, I don't. That'll work. I got it down. God's good. No, I'm afraid I'm going to be seeing double. God is good. I'm going to open your Bible in, in a moment. We'll be looking in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There we go. In a little bit. Today I want to talk to you about the reasons for stalled spiritual transformation. And let me give you a little bit of background here to this message as we get into it. Uh, as we look at 2016, we talk about new beginnings, people making resolutions and all those kind of things that go on. Uh, I think that the space and time that God put us in and created for us, it gives us these measurements of days, times, seasons, years. It gives us also an opportunity to examine ourselves. And New Year's and ends and New Year's beginnings always a good time to not only look at our life, look at our, our, our walk, our, our, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a powerful passage in, in 1 Corinthians and Paul's talking to the church and at, at Corinth and he's, he's mentioning to them the importance about not, not stalling out because they had stalled out. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, we have a tendency in our spiritual life if we're, not, if we're not committed, if we're not disciplined to do the very, that very thing, we just, we just stall out, we just we stop. And stall outs are never, never good in our life. Uh, raising children gave me a greater appreciation for what I'm talking about this day. And raising kids, it's our expectation and it's our goal as parents to raise our kids in a, not just a godly atmosphere, but with a goal in mind for them being more like Christ, to be spiritually mature in their walk in life. And with, with raising kids, you can tell when your kids are growing, when they're not growing, they never stop the growing thing physically, right? They, they advance and they get taller and they all that goes along with that and discover the world around them. But there are times if, if we're not doing a good job parenting that they'll stall out in their transformation of, of really, let's call it maturity, they, getting to the maturity process. I, I know people who have kids that are 30, 40 years old that still haven't matured. Amen. They're still living, living like children. That's not what a parent wants to see. Any more than God our Father wants to see it in our lives when people just stall out. Stall outs are never good. How many of you ever owned an old car that just stalled out on you? You know, you had to get to do something. You may remember a couple of years ago, we were in Dan Greig with a mission group. We had about 34. We had three vans. And if you were on that particular trip, I think we took two that year. But if you were in that one group that year, we had this one van. And by the way, when you rent a vehicle there, you're not renting new vehicles. You're getting cars that, you know, were probably stolen here in, in the U.S. and <laughs> stripped of all the catalytic conversion stuff and taken down to Central America somewhere and then sold again. But you get some unique vehicles down there. We had one van, an old Ford van that, you know, it was about a 15 passenger van that would stall out. In fact, uh, we, we figured a way, we had some genius mechanic, I don't know who it was that had owned one of these old beat up vans before, who said, well, you know, what's happening is you need to shake the van and because uh, and, there's something that's not tripping. And if we all get out of the van and shake it violently, remember any of you on that trip, remember that? You, yeah, you remember that, right? You jump out of the van, four or five on one side, four or five on the other side, and you're rocking it back and forth and shaking it. And uh, then you get back in and start up and it would go on. In Belize, there, you know, uh, their highway systems are not at all like ours. I don't know if you'd call them highways. Their highways are like our back streets. And they have what I call sleeping policemen. I think that's a reference they use in Mexico as well. Uh, basically, a sleeping policeman is a speed bump, all right? Uh, you, you run over it, and it will slow you down if you're going too fast. It seems that every time we came to one of these sleeping policemen speed bumps and went over it, it would stall out. Sure enough, everybody would pile out of the van, get on both sides, and shake it radically until, boom, it'd fire back up, and we'd be on our way. Five or six times over a period of about an hour and a half, we had to bail out of the van. It was worse when we got into town. And, you know, I imagine everybody thought, who are these crazy people bailing out of this van, shaking that thing, then jumping back in? It wasn't a game. It was funny the first time or two. <laughs> it wasn't funny after that, especially when you're trying to get someplace. Well, we finally got the van traded in for another beat up van that didn't stall out at least. But the idea is that the stall outs are not good. And, and, and even in our spiritual lives, we can be that way. We used to, people used to ask me about my ministry when I was in evangelism. Uh, I likened it to that van situation. I said, my ministry is to go into a church, take people up by the nap of their spiritual neck and shake them till they wake up. And I said, that was pretty much m my goal in, in revival ministry is to somehow be that person who rang a real loud alarm and woke people up in a spiritual sense to realize there's a spiritual life all around them abounding and they're missing it. 
One of the worst things that can happen to you in your spiritual life is to stall out. And I'll add to that, one of the worst things that can happen in a church's spiritual life is to stall out. We should always be in the process of transformation. We should always be going to, uh, in, a, in a walk and endeavor of our life of going deeper and going, going further with the Lord. And all too often in the transformation sense, we, we stall. This is exactly where the church of, of Corinth was. They, they were going through this very same thing. There, there are three things I'm going to pull from this passage in a moment when we read it. We'll talk about the reasons behind this, this stall that happened in our spiritual walk in life. Please understand that when God came into your heart and came into your life, if you are a believer, you become a new person in Christ. You're, you are now in a new journey and you're now living a new life. And that life is to be experiencing growth. It's experiencing maturity. It's going farther. It's going deeper. It's becoming, according to the scriptures, becoming more and more and more like Jesus. In reality, if you're a believer, every day you should be experiencing that transformative life. Every day you should be going a little farther, a little deeper, a little more committed in our, our, our life. I mentioned to our, to our first congregation, there was a statement, I can't remember if it was Mickey Bonner or, or Manley. By the way, Mickey's granddaughter is with us today, so y'all give uh, Nicole a hand and praise the Lord and welcome to our church this morning. Said something like this, it went on, if you're more, if you were more in love with Jesus yesterday than you are today, then you're backslidden. Really, if you're more in love with Jesus any time in the past than you are in the present, then you're backslidden. What's happened? There's been a spiritual stall that's taken place. We need to jump out and shake the van. We need to shake ourselves. It's like the Word of God. The Bible says, you know, that the James says that the Word of God is like a mirror and we should behold ourselves in it. Today, we want to hold up a mirror and get a little glimpse to see if we're living the transformed life or if we somewhere... And somehow in the journey, in the process, going through the motions of transformed lives, but not really experiencing a transformed life. Uh, I, my wife looked at me very adoringly the other night and she was kind of staring at me and she said, oh, you're, you're just more handsome than ever. At that point, I reached into my glasses, my pocket, took my glasses out and said, you might want to try these. <laughs> said that the beauty of old age is that your eyes start diminishing so that when you, you look in the mirror, thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. That when you look in the mirror, you know, uh, you look really good until you put these on. Say, oh, Lord, help me. The idea is that uh, none of us, you know, needs to be stuck in those kind of places. They are there. They are a reality. Spiritual stalls do come in our life. And what we want to do is be able to be honest with ourselves and let the Holy Spirit shake us, so to say, you know, get out and move the van around a little bit so that we wake up and see that, that the place that we're at is not the place that God would have us at that time. We are to be going on and we are to be experiencing a transformed life. The church at Corinth, as Paul's writing this letter, is, uh, is much like the, the world today and the church today. You take away the amenities of the modern modern life in the modern world, you could place the city of Houston right beside the city of Corinth and pretty much come up with an identical city. It was filled with immorality, with homosexuality, with, with ungodliness, drunkenness, you know, the drug culture. Everything was rampant there as it is today. Yes, there were drugs in the days of Jesus, all right? There were drugs all the way back to the time of Moses. In case some of you don't understand, all the way back to after the fall, men began to discover ways to intoxicate himself. It doesn't take much of a reading of history to figure that out. But when you compare Houston beside Corinth, there's not really any difference. The same issues that Paul was talking to the church at Corinth about are the same issues that we need to be talking to the, the nation of America about, the state of Texas, the city of Houston or Spring, or wherever you reside. The message is still the same to the church. And when Paul looked at the Corinthians, he said, you're not where you should be. In fact, let, let's look at this passage in Scripture. And, and he says, brothers... I do not want you to be, I don't want you, I was not able to speak to your spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, and the King James says, as carnal, as babes in Christ, I fed you milk, not solid food, because you were not yet able to receive it. In fact, you are still not able because you are still carnal or fleshly, for since there's envy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and living like ordinary people? Now understand, these people had lost their salvation, all right? Because once we give our life to Christ, we are sealed with a seal of redemption and grace. 
But it is possible that once we are saved to lose our passion and to lose our, our intensity and to lose that transformative work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's like the, the momentum stops. The progression stops. And it's like we stall and we're settled in one place. What the scriptures teach and what the Paul continued, whether it was the Romans or the Corinthians, the Ephesians, whoever it was in writing these letters that were inspired of the Holy Spirit, there's the same letters that should inspire us by the Holy Spirit. He was saying to them, you are, in, you are not in a place in this spiritual realm where you can just settle down. You're in a war. There's a war zone. There's, there's a battle that rages every day to keep you from being all that God desires you to be. We don't war against flesh and blood, the scripture says. There's a spiritual battle. Listen to Romans 8, verses 8 and 9. Those who, whose lives are in the flesh are unable to please God. He's talking to believers. He's saying you're going to live after the flesh or you're going to live a life in pursuit of the spirit. You're going to live a life that's a, a spirit-filled life or you're going to live a life that's just a life of the flesh. And if you're going to live a life of the flesh, then you'll pursue the things of the flesh. Your momentum will be to the world. It won't be to that transformed life. He said that you can't please God this way. You, however, you know, he's talking about you've been born of the spirit. You're not the flesh, but you've been born of the spirit since the spirit of God lives in you. And if no man, if you have, if you do not have the spirit of Christ, he says, then you're none of his. In other words, if you've come to Jesus, you've committed your life to him. You have given him your heart. He comes into you. Sometimes we forget that. We forget that we really, really are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I mean, just settle on that for a moment. God lives in you. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your vessel, in your body. He lives there and he lives there with intent. He lives there with the purpose of transforming you into the life of Jesus Christ, that your life becomes that is, which is the life of Christ and you follow him, you pursue him, your love is for him. And when people look at you, guess who they see? They see him. And that's the desire of the Holy Spirit in me is to exalt Jesus as the Lord of every, in every area of my life, to be Christ-like and to be transformed by his presence and by his power. But the, the Corinthians had stopped in this process and they had stalled out. The old self, he says, when I came to you, I spoke to you as babes. And the word when he talks about when I came to you, you were carnal. And that's the word. Which is, it's more like it would be the, the, in the English language. If it's, it's two words in the Greek language. It, it, the King James says you're carnal and you're still carnal. One is sarkikos, one sarkinos. And one's, one where he talks about the first one, you're carnal. It is a word which means to be you're, you're, like, you're like children, which is okay. It's all right for a baby to act like a baby when it's a baby. But when you grow up and you're still acting like a baby, something's wrong. And that was the idea here. You were babies. I fed you with milk. That's what you needed. Babies don't eat meat. All right. They're, they're, I fed you milk. You got the baby food. But now I come back to you. You should have grown. You should be progressing. He said, but you are yet carnal. Now, again, in the, in the Greek language, those words are different. Sarkikos, Sarkinos, they're, they're similar. But the idea is, well, here is somebody who should have grown, but hasn't. It uses, in this translation, the word fleshly, which is an adverb. It, it describes their behavior, the way they're living their lives. In other words, you should be grown up. It, it's like the Lord, we are the children of God, and we live as children of God, but as we grow in grace, we're not supposed to be childish anymore. Do you understand the context? I'm not acting childish. Maturity is happening. We are growing in grace. We're growing in the word of the Lord. We're growing in our relationship with God. We're knowing him more as we're yielding our lives to him more. But what happens? Same thing happened at Corinth. They're living in the world and they're letting the world dictate how they should live their life. They're letting the things, the surroundings, what's popular, what's cultural happenings. They're letting all those things influence their walk, influence their behavior, influence their speech, instead of letting the Holy Spirit. What's happened? They've stalled out. They started right, they're finishing wrong. They begin good, but they're not pursuing. They, they move forward and then the engine, so to say, died and the pursuit quit. And, and it's easy in this kind of spiritual situation to go through the motions to be, do the religious things and miss the beauty of the fellowship of the spirit in your life and miss the beauty of walking with God and miss the beauty of realizing purpose and intent in regard to your life 
into your church. And this is exactly where they were. So it's a tragic that when people stall or even when churches stall, that something has to happen. The best thing to happen is to realize and be honest about what God says in his word about us. Let me give you three things out of here that tell us why the transformation process stalls in our spiritual life and why we don't grow. It's a pretty simplistic message. It obviously stalls without spiritual exercise. He says, you're still acting like babies. You haven't grown. You're not, you're not moving forward. You're not maturing. You're not growing. We know in the physical sense that healthy growth, you have to have movement. All right. And not just movement, exercise. There needs to be a function of moving. What happens? You become stagnant. You become stale. You get overweight. All those things happen to us when we're not we're not we're not exercising. Now, we know that the Christian life is a life of grace. Right. I'm saved by grace. You got that down. We all got that really good. But uh, but my life now is is a grace life, which means I this grace of God that given me. Now I let it affect my life so that I'm starting to do something with that grace of God. And a lot of people don't understand the grace of God. I mean, you probably grew up as well as I did in church. It's, you know, if you grew up in church and the, the, the definition of grace went something like this. Grace is just God overlooking our sins. How many have heard that definition? Come on, if you've heard that definition before you raise your hand. All right. Four of you. That's me included. And, and that was the mindset. Grace is God overlooking your sins. Are y'all here this morning? You can see everybody's eyes are open. Sometime the light's a little blinding up there. Are y'all okay over there, Glenn? If she goes to sleep again, give her the elbow, would you? <laughs> it's not God overlooking your sins. It's not. The cameraman hates me when I do that. <laughs> it's not God just, oh, okay, I bless your heart. You're forgiven. No. Grace is God empowering your life. And forgiveness coming. And when forgiveness comes, it deals with the sin issue. Yes. It doesn't just overlook it. Well, you can stay in it. That's not God. God doesn't overlook it. God sent his son Jesus to die so that your sins could be forgiven and cleansed and taken away. The Bible says in 1 John that Jesus Christ was manifest to take away your sin. To do all with it. Take it away. To do all with it. We're going to stay here till y'all wake up. To take away your sin. Now, if he died to take away our sins, what are we still holding on to him for? Well, I don't know if I can let go. Grace says you can, because grace is a power word in the Greek language. It literally means that God has exuded, exerted, and implanted the power to do his will in your heart. He gives you what you need. He gives you what you need. You can do this. You can live for Jesus. You can. You can be transformed. You can grow in Christ. You can be mature. You can do all those things. You can study the word. You can pray. You can win souls. All those things are now glorious possibilities because the grace of God has come. The very power of God, the Bible says, that raised Jesus from the dead has been placed in your mortal bodies. That's, that's grace. <laughs> That means that God gives me. But hey, if I, don't, if I don't act on it, if I don't step out in faith, if I don't follow in faith, you know, then there is no exercise. You say, what kind of exercise are you talking about? Let me give you the, the 201 class that we do in a very condensed form. One, it means time in God's word. You know, you just can't take the Bible, put it on your head like this and say, OK. Oh, yes. Amen. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. I'm here, OK. It doesn't work. But you know, some of you think that. Well, I don't either. You come to church once a week, maybe even twice. And you sit there and you hear the Bible and you say, amen, isn't that good? And you think that you have actually absorbed the word. You think you've actually studied the Bible. You think you've actually read the Bible. You just did one of about five steps in regard to the word of God. You have heard the word. And that's an important part. But a better part, the greater part, the important part, the part we would call exercise, the part that acts on the grace of God is to read the word and study the word. You have to have time with God. This is the basis of our, our, our meat. This is our milk. It's our meat. It's our bread. And if we do not consume this, except once a week, then it's like this. 
You stuck it on your head for an hour or two. You listen to the headphones, whatever it might be. You heard a radio preacher. You have got to be in the Bible. If you want to make a resolution for the year, you'd commit to this. Lord, this year belongs to you and I will spend time with you in your word. But not only spend time with you in your word, I'll spend time with you in prayer. I'm going to take this is I'm going to be committed to this new life and for me to know your will, to know your voice, to understand your ways and to understand you. I'm going to have to know you by getting in your word and spending time with you. It's not going to come by the osmosis factor. It's not going to come by, by hanging around spiritual people. There's a guy in the scripture who hang around one of the most spiritual men in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. This guy's name was Demas. He traveled with him. He followed him. He listened to him every sermon. He probably read all his letters. But the Bible says, Paul wrote of Demas, he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He chose one of the only two courses of action for every one of us. It's the world or it's God's will. That's the only two options that are before us. It's God's way or the world's way. And we know that God's way is foolishness to the world, is it not? We also know that the world's way is foolishness to God. So both ways, depending on who you are, appear foolish. That's when Paul said, listen, <clears throat> I will choose to be a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? I'll be the fool for Jesus. If that's what the world thinks a fool is, I'll be the fool. And so did you. But we, we, can't, we can't just kind of meander about the spiritual life and expect to live a transformed life. I think every one of us should be involved, not only in church and hearing the word of God, and not only in lift groups and Bible studies that we participate in, but there has to be, you know, setting aside a personal time with the word of God. That If you don't do that, you're on a quick, sure road to, to a stall in your spiritual transformation. So you're in the word and you're in prayer. I mean, when I talk about prayer, I'm talking about truly spending time with the Lord, spend some time listening, spend some time hearing, spend some time speaking, but, you know, just... Moving in the presence of God and hearing what God says and learning how to agree with it and learn how to walk in it. Another element of, of that's what I would call spiritual exercise is that of remaining active and sharing the gospel. The quickest way to stall out in your spiritual life is quit being concerned about lost people. Quit being committed to reaching lost people. Every one of us are called. Every one of us have been called to be the light and to be the salt. You can't be the light in a dark world and you can't be the salt of the earth if you're not speaking, if you're not identifying yourself. Well, you know, I don't really want to identify myself, Pastor. I don't want people to know who I am. Listen, if you're a Christian, I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. You are light, all right? You don't light a candle and put it under a bushel. Jesus made that clear. You don't light a candle and put it under a bed. A light is to be seen. The Bible says that it may be seen of everyone in the house. In other words, wherever you are, people should know you're a believer. By your attitude, by your actions, by your words, and by your testimony. I am not ashamed of the gospel, the scripture says. It is the power of God. But yet we stall out and we forget that what we have, this message we share, is life transforming. It's life changing. People's lives are literally turned around, changed for eternity by the power of that word. God's word. So the, the way we, we, we prove that we're in a stalled out place is that we're, we don't share the gospel anymore. We're not, we're not committed to the cause of Christ. We're not committed to reaching people. I believe that our church is in that, that stalled out mode right now as a, as a whole. And we can talk about the church. Yeah, amen, brother, we are. Hey, we are the church. So when we say we, we mean we, all right? You, me, all of us. We have to come to a place in our life where we're not so stinking selfish. We realize that we're here to shine. We're here to speak. We're here. We're here to invite people to church. We're here to invite people to Christ. We're here to influence people daily. Whenever God gives us the opportunity. And if we don't do that, then what happens when you stall out? You just come cold and you die. I don't believe that's the will of God. There are so many positives that I can set and glory in and rejoicing in talking about our church and our fellow. There are so many good people, so many good things, so many ministries, so many things that are happening. But folks, if we lose our heart for people who are lost and are hurting and in bondage and dying and going to hell, then we lose the race. We're here to be a difference maker. And part of the transformed life is realizing that. Now, I'm not saying that we read our Bible, we pray, we study, we tell people about Jesus, and that makes us right with God. No, I'm saying if we are right with God, one, there'll be an evidence of it, and these are the things that become evident. 
because we're focusing on God and we're focusing on others and we're even focusing on you know, in each other. In a way, that's that that's the attitude of service. That's that element of that spiritual exercise of just giving of ourselves, whether it's our time, whether it's our talents, whether it's our treasures, whatever it is, God uses the service that we give within the body of Christ to not only to transform our lives and conform us to the image of Christ, he uses what I do for his glory to transform you and your walk in life. So when you look this morning, we hold up the mirror. Where are you? You know, I tell you the number one thing, what is the number one resolution in America come New Year's Eve and New Year's Day that people, this year I'm going to, basically I'm going to exercise. I'm going to watch my intake. All right? You can't lose weight without watching what you take in and what you do. Sorry to tell you that. Now, I know some of you are looking for the magic pill. It doesn't exist. And you, I know some of you are buying the magic pill, but it still doesn't exist. You were told it was a magic pill. I love that ad. You don't even have to exercise. Just take this. Damn, how that works for your heart later on. <laughs> you have to exercise. Or you're going to stall out. You, you have to move forward. If you're going to make a commitment this year, commit to something that will change things in all of eternity. Committing yourself, you start the year out and you start each day out by saying, Lord, this year, 2016, it's going to be a year of transformation. It's going to be a year of transformation for me and my family, for your glory, for my church. It's going to be a year of transformation. And how do you do that? You start each day by saying, Lord, today I'm going to be completely yours. Transformation stalls without spiritual exercise in life. Here's the other two. Transformation stalls amidst envy and strife because this was a real problem in the church of Corinth. Paul's continual rebuke to them. Not only in this chapter, it goes through chapter four, chapter five, chapter six, chapter seven, chapter eight. He starts dealing with them about the issues that were facing them in the world, that they were more interested in the world and they were more interested in having what somebody else had and getting what somebody else had than they were in pleasing God. Envy and strife, that's the fruit of that kind of living. If you're going to pursue that other path, the world, if that's the path of pursuit for you, then you're not going to be transformed, you're going to be conformed to the world. When Paul wrote the church in Romans, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What happens? If you're on that path, then what, what, what you're interested in is, is what do people think about me? And what can I get? Well, we're living in the perfect age for this, too, because with, with modern, uh, you know, communications with the media and advertising and marketing, it's constant, constant uh, uh, presentation before us through radio, through sound, through, 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 through media, through TV, through movies that, hey, you'll never be happy unless you drive this or you wear that or you look like this or you have this. Or, you know, you've got to be all, the all-American idol. You know, you've got to be it. And everybody's pursuing it. And it ain't it. Is not. It leads to nowhere. And what, what, what results with that life, he says here, is a life of envy and strife. Any pursuit that excludes Jesus always end up over here. So we're either, we're, we're either desiring and, and looking towards one avenue or the other. If, if, if we're looking towards the world, we end up with a heart filled with envy. You say, what is envy? Envy is wanting someone else's life more than we want the life of Christ for the believer. Wanting what somebody else's life is like other than the life of Jesus. It's either envy or it's jealousy. You say, what's jealousy? Jealousy is when we want what others have more than we want Christ himself. Are you with me on this? Envy, I want someone's life more than what I want to be like Christ. Jealousy, we want what others have more than we want Christ himself. These forms of selfishness is all it is. These forms of selfishness always move us away from a spiritual transformation. And this is exactly where the Corinthians were. They wanted to be what, like everybody else, have what everybody else. And ultimately, the Bible describes these as sinful. These are sinful characteristics in your life that will move you away from being transformed by the living power of God that dwells in you. We need believers and we need churches that experience a transformation that is just the opposite. That we want what God wants. We want God's will. We want God's work in our life. We want God to transform our lives. The churches that are making a difference, the Christians that are making a difference are the ones that have not stalled out, but are truly pursuing. The third aspect of reason for stalled spiritual transformation is when we just live like the world. He says in verse three, are you not carnal like and fleshly living like ordinary people? Good question. Living like, that's the indictment though, isn't it? 
Now catch this. This is not, this is not a pat on the back. If you understand the depth of what the scriptures are saying here, this is a, a strong indictment against us. You say, what is it? That we would live like ordinary people. Why is that such a terrible thing? Because we are not ordinary people. If you're a believer, you've been transformed by the grace of God. You're a new creation. You're not what you used to be. You're new. You're a priest of the Lord. You're a child of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus. You're a citizen of a different kingdom, a kingdom of light. You're not ordinary according to the world. You are extraordinary. In fact, it goes beyond that. It goes to, you, you have a comp completely different kind of life. You were so out of the realm of ordinary, you, you stick out like the world says, a sore thumb. We live a life not to fit in. Not to fit in, not to be like everybody else in the world. We live a life to be different, to be unique, to be extraordinary, not to live like ordinary people. We should not settle for ordinary. We should settle for nothing less than God's best for our life. And that's the extraordinary. That's the transformed life. That's the life of Jesus being manifest in us. Let me read you a quote from C.S. Lewis. He, he wrote a book called, it's familiar for me with C.S. Lewis and the trilogy and the Hobbit and all those things. But he wrote this book called The Weight of Glory. Catch this. He wrote, <clears throat> we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't even imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased, end of quote. We are too easily pleased. We think that the world's gonna give us some kind of satisfaction and some kind of fulfillment, and it never does. It's only a pursuit of Christ, living as God's called us to live, that we are living the kind of life God wants us. Everything else is like fooling with, with dollar store toys. I used to use illustration and evangelism and said, it's always amazing. Here's God and he set this beautiful banquet of life and peace and abundance and joy and grace and heaven. And then we're over here picking out of the garbage can looking for a dry piece of baloney because the world says that's good. And it's not. Life's too brief to live like the world. Amen. Life's too short to let it pass and not be transformed by the power of Christ, taking pleasure in the so-called trinkets. It's counterintuitive to what God desires of our lives, to live a higher. And at Believer's Fellowship and this pulpit, may God shut it down if it ever gets to the point that we are not always calling people to a higher life, to a better life, to a deeper walk, to a broader relationship, to a stronger commitment to Christ. It must always be sounding from our, from our Bible studies, from our lift groups, from our churches, from every fellowship. It always should be sounding. Come to life. Jesus offers life. Let's live that life. What happens? I mean, we just think about it for a moment. What if in 2016, this year, that each person, it's a part of Believer's Fellowship, those here today, those not here today, if each person would just pray something like this and from the heart mean it, Lord, today I choose to be sold out to you. Transformation begins. Fullness of life begins. If we pray like, Lord, let me cross past the day with somebody who needs you. Let me be sensitive to the needs of the people around me. Lord, today, sold out to you, putting you and others ahead of myself. Lord, today, rejecting the, the appeal and the call to the world, instead to listen to your appeal and your call to a deeper life, to a fuller life, to a fuller meaning. So when Paul wrote this little brief note to the Corinthians, it wasn't the end of it. In chapter four, he starts dealing with them about, after chapter three, he's dealing with about their foundations and not, not building their life on the world, but building their life on Jesus Christ. In chapter four, he talks about being a servant of Christ and learning how to put Christ and other people first. In chapter five, he deals with the immoral issues that they're facing, the immorality, the prostitution, all those things that were underlined in there. In chapter six, he's talking about relationship with each other. Quit suing each other, start loving each other. Find, them, find a way to reconcile with one another. 
one another. Learn how to be brothers and sisters in the family of God. Get along with each other. In chapter 8, it talks about guarding your liberties. That you are children of grace, but do not, do not take that grace for selfish advantage. Don't think it's somehow you can go live the way you want to and call it grace. That God understands. In chapter 9, he talks about just striving to be what God's called you to be. But that's not the striving like the world. It's a commitment to follow Jesus. It's that commitment to say, today, Lord, I trust you. And I respect you. And I fear you more than the world system around me. I think today, too many people simply hope to survive the day, somehow come through it unnoticed or unscathed. And that's not the will of God. That kind of mentality is too much like the world and too little like Jesus. There's always a risk of suffering. There's always a risk of loss to live the life of Christ. But I'd rather lose a little something here and gain everything in eternity than to, than to gain everything here and have nothing in eternity. The people that will experience transformation this day, this week, this month, this year, are the people who will throw it all out on the line and say, Jesus, your Lord. Now, I know, folks, that we have these kind of moments, and usually it's a crisis moment that brings us to that. Unfortunately, the, those crisis moments can be cathartic, so to say, if we look to Jesus, if we trust him, if we believe in him. Satan does everything he can to dissuade you. You must realize as a child of God, you are in a constant, constant, listen to me, a constant battle that will seek to cause you to doubt God, to question his goodness, and to not believe his word. Every day, in a thousand ways, we're all faced with those things. People who tell us we're foolish, a world who says that's ridiculous, scientists and psychologists and sociologists and educators from the, from the world system who say, that's ridiculous, nobody lives that way, that was not true, how do you know that's true? And they say that what we believe is true, what you believe is false, who's to say who's right and wrong? God, who created all things, determines who's right and wrong. So I choose faith even when I doubt. I'll choose faith even when I hurt. I'll choose faith even when everything says don't. We do because we believe God. Don't, don't settle in for mediocrity. Don't think that just kind of good enough is good enough. The natural order of things in this world is for what? It's for energy to wane. Things to become slower and come ultimately to a grinding halt. But not in the Christian life. The Bible says we're renewed day by day. The Bible tells us we go from glory to glory. That God has created new life in us and wants to transform us each day to experience that new life. And Christ's plan, God's plan, Jesus' plan for your life and my life is that we keep moving forward and not to stall out somewhere so that we become more and more and more and more like him. So we decide that stalling is not an option. We decide that not reading my Bible and not praying and not sharing and not coming to Christ and not enjoying, Christ, that's not an option. We come to him. Stalling is no longer an option. We choose hope that's born from, from transformation and from renewal of God's Spirit working in us. Would you stand with your heads bowed?